In the 2018 census, 18.3% of the population identified as Latinx or Latino. And historically, we have not seen ourselves in many different positions, such as film and TV, as CEOs, as leads of shows. I've invited a panel here to talk with me about how they persevered against that and also what we can do to continue this representation and to push our community forward. So first, I have Mike Alfaro. He created Millennial Loteria. I will absolutely let him talk about it more when we get there. I also have Luis Martinez, who is the founder and CEO of We The Plug. And of course, Chelsea Rendon, who is a actress and have been in many, many things, but most recently in Vida. And I'm Geneva Fay, and I will be your host today. All right, um, so kind of gave you guys a little bit of introductions, but I would love for you guys to introduce yourself. So I'll start with you, Mike, um, if you want to tell us who you are and what you do for work. My name is Mike Alfaro, and I'm the creator of Millennial Loteria. Uh, it's a board game that is based on a very loved Hispanic tradition that a lot of Latinos grew up playing. Um, and I just wanted to give it a little modern twist to bring this tradition to feel more relevant to Latinos today. And there was a lack of, I think, representation for Latinos too in that game aisle. Like if you're walking down the game aisle and all you see is like games for people in the United States, you know, where are those for the Latino, from basically for those, you know, the Hispanic American uh, people that sometimes don't get enough recognition or don't get things specifically because being Hispanic American is, sometimes very different than an experience that other Latinos will have. I mean, for instance, I'm from Guatemala, so I came to this country from another, from like growing up Latino in Latin American country, and I find myself that there's many differences between Latinos in the United States, Latinos from Guatemala and other places, but there's so many things that unite us, and I think this game sort of bridges that gap between um, those two experiences. Luis, I'll turn to you. Yeah, so um, my name is Luis Martinez, founder and CEO of We The Plug. And so basically what we do is we help scale and build um, companies, uh, particularly black and Latinx companies from early stages, from the moment they have the idea on a napkin to the point that they want to scale, get employees and get customers. And so we use what we call in um, the culture design thinking, and we also use no code technology to help build and scale their companies. And so um, really got the idea because there was no one in the space that really did things from a cultural aspect in tech. Uh, you have a lot of people that do things just from a technical side, but from a cultural and making it fun and making it innovative, I didn't really see that. I wanted to talk to Black and Latinx founders about their pain points, right? Because I've heard all this stuff about, you know, we have lack of access to capital and no one wants to give us money, blah, 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 right? So. Um, decided to kind of do a hack, right? And so I put an event, right? Kind of put everything together. Say, hey, like, you know, meet me in the coffee shop. I would love to hear, you know, about your pain points about you as an entrepreneur, right? And so did that, put it up. And so my initial, um, I guess, expectations were to have five to seven people show up. And that was a win for me, you know what I'm saying? Like I get to converse with people and, you know, exchange information, LinkedIn, all that good stuff. And I'm good. And that was my expectation. That was my goal. And it ended up being 80 people. Wow. And it was crazy. And on my website, I actually have the picture of it. Culturally, we the plug means we're the connectors. We got to put each other on. We can't rely on others to help us. So um, that's kind of hence where the name comes from. So yeah. And Chelsea? Um, so I am an actress slash producer slash content creator. Um, I added those little hyphens <laughs> more recently, um, but I've been acting since I was six years old. So it's literally all I've done my entire life. It's been my dream since as long as I can remember. I feel like I came out of the womb ready to perform. And when I was younger, I didn't notice it because I was a kid acting. So I didn't see the lack of representation because I saw myself there. But in the last like 10 years, it's been very glaring. Like, wow, like, again, you talk about the numbers and the census and then like on TV, we're like 3% um, of like lead roles or even speaking roles. And, you know, being a part of a show like Vida that is so brown inside and out was very beautiful and very fulfilling. And I think that we need as many projects as that as possible. Again, not only with people in front of the camera, but behind the camera. You know, we need executives 
and executive levels and CEO levels that will give the green light to those projects. And I've just been lucky to work on some amazing things and also in the process of creating my own things so I could also be creating my own jobs and my own opportunities and opportunities for other people as well. I want to open it up to the rest. If you growing up saw somebody in the position that you're in now or doing what you wanted to do, or was there something that you wanted to do that you thought you couldn't do simply because you didn't see somebody that felt like they represented you? For me specifically, growing up in another country, I was exposed to a lot of American television as well. Globalization is everywhere, obviously. So like a lot of American television made its way to Guatemala. And for me, I think seeing um, the guy from the Sandlot, remember the- oh, Yes, Benny. Benny from the Benny Sandlot. The he was Rodriguez. such, exactly such a great character for like seeing yourself represented because not only was he cool, he was, you know, he was badass. He was like, um, and he, he could, you know, he was sort of like a leader, you know, somebody people look up to and not, and he was a Latino. And so I think that's a movie that even though you don't necessarily think of it as like a Latino mm -hmm. representation movie, it has a character that I think I really connected with. Mm -hmm. um, so I think those are kind of characters that always inspired me. And even though I'm not obviously a sports guy here, someone <laughs> who's doing a lot of, you know, I'm not, not, not like huge in that. It is just that idea of having someone that you see people looking up to. And I think that's just, it doesn't necessarily mean something was doing what I'm doing, but someone who people respect and people from other cultures um, see as a leader. I think that's really important. How about like outside of film and TV? Because of course we hear Latinx representation so much. It's so heavily grounded in like Hollywood and, and what we see. But what about um, a CEO or, or an entrepreneur like you are creating something new? Did you see anybody in those roles? For me, it was less about finding other people and seeing like the hard work that my mom put, you know, and the hard work that came to like me even being allowed to come to the United States, you know, and like the hardship that that put on them. So I think for me, that was the type of representation that I wasn't seeing really in media, but I was seeing it in my family. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think for a lot of Latinos, they're moms too, you know, they're the person that you look up to. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't necessarily need to be a CEO in a, in a way but I don't really remember being growing up and knowing much about CEOs at that time. You know, like when you're growing up, you really don't care that much about who's running this company, you know? We don't um, know to think about and you don't that. Know, yeah, don't you don't know. know. It's not a part of it, yeah. Who's behind, yeah. Who's behind the, the yeses and the noes. Mm -hmm. yeah. The gatekeeper. Who's exactly. writing the check? Who's writing the check? Exactly. Yeah. But you probably know more about I mean, I, I grew up around CEOs, but they were drug dealers, so. Um, <laughs> you know, that's a little different. Jay-Z, that was, yeah. Yeah, started, you know, yeah. A little, little different, but... um. Yeah, so I want to harp on your point that you just made. And so when I was younger, I, I had the fortunate privilege to play professional basketball. So I played in you know, junior high, high school, college, and professional. And so that was my life before what I do now. And so I love basketball. And I looked at different players. And if you know anything about New York, it, in basketball, is a culture there. It's a little different. It's almost, it's equivalent of Texas in football, mm -hmm. especially back then in the 90s. And so one of the people that I looked up to um, just so happened to be, he was, I mean, first of all, he was like nationally known, uh, Felipe Lopez. Mm -hmm. And he looked like me. We had the same skin color. He was the number one high school player in America. You know, he was in the Bronx. He was uh, Dominican. He's from the Dominican Republic. And so um, my family was from Honduras. So, you know, we looked at it like, man, like he looks like us. And I had cousins who looked up to him, even though they were the same age as him. And like, it was like crazy to see someone just so revered. And so that was surreal to go to the games and see all the hoopla. And so I didn't necessarily look at it from a Latino perspective of, oh, you know, he can do it, I can do it. I just looked at someone that looked like me and just was like, hey, he's doing it, why can I? And so flip it now into what I'm doing now in tech and innovation. Even when I'm in the room, let's say I go to an event, particularly for black folks, right? And I'm in the room with other people. A lot of the folks in my space grew up differently than I did. Mm -hmm. And so you have a lot of folks that have the pedigree of they went to an HBCU or they went to an Ivy League school. I was raised a little differently. So <laughs> um, I come in with a different swag, a different flavor, and a lot of folks are not used to that. So I've always been in the camp of you know being used to being different and I never really cared about, oh, you're this and you're that, or 
I can't do this because of, you know, I'm Afro Latino or whatever. I never cared about that. So I figured, hey, if I'm gonna get into an industry, there's going to be pitfalls, there's gonna be microaggressions, there's gonna be all that you know, stuff that comes with it. And I'm just have to take it and keep it pushing and get up every time. I feel that way. So yeah. That's hard to do. It's super hard to do because even now when I'm in a room and more to just go on what you were saying um, about like the microaggressions and all that, I feel a little bit like an imposter sometimes in my position. It's really about, see, I'm crazy. See, <laughs> see, I'm old school. So, you know, a lot of things don't really phase me. And I grew up in New York in the crack era. So there's a lot of things that I've seen prior to me becoming who I am now that things that happen now, it doesn't really phase me. So, um, you know, it's, it's no one cares about your feelings. You know, you still got to get up, right? You still got to get to work and pay your bills and, you know, do whatever. So, um, yeah, I just go at it with that attitude and that's pretty much it. You know, um, everything else is excuses to me. So, yeah. And, you know, for me, because I grew up in the business, it's all I've known. So like so many people, it was actually an, an acting class. I was at um, the Ivana Chubbuck studio and she wrote the book, The Power of the Actor. And I was sitting there with my friend, Bobby Soto, who was uh, also one of my good friends that I worked with on A Better Life years ago, but also in The Tax Collector recently with David Ayer. And she was giving notes to someone that was performing. And she's like, you're, you're an actor in this, in, as this character, you're an actor. So you can be dramatic and feel this. And, and it's that depression of like, am I gonna give up? And am I gonna go away? I'm never gonna work again. And she was talking about all these like negative thoughts. And I was sitting there like, I've never felt like that. Huh? And then I whispered to Bobby, I was like, hey man, have you ever felt like that? And he's like, nah. And it was like, maybe cause we're born and raised in LA. So we didn't leave our family and come here and then we also started as kids. We started young, Bobby started young as well. So I think it's, it really depends. Everybody has a different situation. Can I just interrupt real quick, two seconds? Like my parents, right? Particularly my father, right? He came here from Honduras and lived in New York. And so he worked for Coca-Cola for a number of years, uh, 30 years. And I seen him bust his ass every day, broken bones, legs, all that good stuff. And I look at it like, okay, if I'm going through this issue where a, a, a big company is not wanting to do partnerships with me, how big of a problem really is that? You know what I mean? In the hindsight of things, you know? And so that's how I look at things. And so I'm team no excuses. And I get that from him in particular. Got it from my mother too, but him in particular. When I was in college, you know, I, I worked in the morning. I went to school, played basketball. Um, still had to keep grades. So I did that all at the same time. And I got that from him. And he came with a no excuses attitude. So that's how I approach everything in life, you know, yeah. as an adult. That mama so. mentality. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. And, sure. and again, there, not everybody can be a mama. You know what I mean? Like that's something too, where it's like, if you don't have that mentality, it's okay. But like, understand some people do have that mentality. And yeah. imposter syndrome is very like, millennial type of term in terms of what this is you know i don't really think that if you go back generations people were really talking about this imposter syndrome mm -hmm. but i think a lot of the times too it's from growing up from a lot of boomers and a lot of older people kind of telling us younger generation like you're not special you know like a lot of people like we grew people say like oh they grew up giving you participation trophies all these things and i was like i remember growing up now here in the united states with all these gatekeepers all these like older people telling you like you're not special, you're, you know, you're nothing great. You're just so, in, you guys are so entitled. And that gives you a mentality. I think for me, not of imposter syndrome, I think for other people it could, but for me it was like, I'm gonna show you. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna show you who you, who this is. So I think for me, imposter syndrome is something that, and I can see it from you guys here, that is something that you just, ha we have to get over. Mm -hmm. And you just have to like stop dwelling on this idea of like, you don't belong somewhere because you can belong somewhere if you try, if you put effort into it and there's going to be obstacles. Like obviously everyone's had those obstacles put in front of them, but it's about overcoming them. And I think that once you do that, you kind of get all over that imposter syndrome because like, oh, I did this, I did that, you know, and no, how many times did I walk into a room with like millennial teoria as an idea for people that, and they just blank face didn't get it, you know? And I, at that point I, I did, you feel like, well, what am I doing here? You know, like people telling you, you're a nobody, you're not going to get this made. And then 
walking out of those meetings, I was just more fired up and energized, being like, you have no idea what you missed out on, you know? Yeah. And now we're like at the point where we can't keep it in stock in Target. Like the game's selling out in Targets across the United States yeah. and we can't keep it in stock. And I think back of these people being like, you lost out. Mm -hmm. And even now with all the success, I think of all the, all the companies too that now are coming to us, you know? And that are wanting to work with us. And that feels really great because they're, they're giving you that power. Mm -hmm. um, so when one of them doesn't want to work with us or doesn't want to do something, I'm just like, it's their loss. You know, somebody else will understand this. And I think it's because they don't have that insight yeah. into Latino culture that, that we were able to have. And with Loteria, it's such a powerful thing for a lot of people. Um, and even if you don't know it, it's still one of the only options for like Latino games out there. You know, <laughs> this is funny. You know, with, with this whole phase, I, I want to kind of go deep into this, right? So we have the injured, are you injured or are you hurt? Right? Syndrome, right? So injured is like, okay, you're, okay, you're, you're hurting. I mean, you're injured, but you can still kind of get out there and play. You're hurt, that means you, you can't play, right? You're hurt, that's what it is. So with that being said, I think when imposter syndrome, right, is it, are you injured or are you hurt? Because let's just say, for example, let's just use the example you said, right? Companies don't want to work with you, right? And it's a company that you really wanted to collaborate with and you don't get that deal. Yeah, you're a human, you're a human being, right? You're going to go in the corner, you're going to cry for five minutes, do all that stuff. Now, once you then stay in the corner for five minutes, now what is, what is it going to be? Like, are you going to get out the corner or you're going to just stay there? Right. So now it's, are you injured or are you hurt? Do, how are you ever going to know if you can do it if you don't try? Well, and it's again, you can have imposter syndrome, but don't let it paralyze you. Don't let it you. paralyze. Exactly. Don't let it stop you. Go into the room, go into the meeting and just show up because if you don't show up, no one's going to show up for you. See, and that's exactly what this conversation comes back to is that that happens to our community and people of color in general. The white population of the U.S. has things handed to them. Mm -hmm. They see themselves. It is very easy to get a loan, to start a business. Well, it's nepotism. It's, it's uh, course, trust fund kids that course. don't have to do as much. Yeah, and maybe they do, you know, but it, it is historically harder for us to get things off the ground to, and again, always comes back to because we just don't even see ourselves there. Mm -hmm. But it does sound like from this conversation that you guys, maybe it wasn't a media, maybe it wasn't somebody that you can specifically point to, but I'm hearing from both of you that it's about your, your parents. Yep, same. Yeah, you like 100%. a yeah. lot of that strength comes yeah. from the fact that our parents worked so, so yes. hard. Yeah, and I, I would be remiss if I add this to the conversation. And so I had the very unique privilege of growing up in the projects. And in the projects, you have primarily African-American families. And a lot of my friends that I grew up with grew up in single parent homes. And that wasn't me. I grew up in a two parent household. I was the oldest out of four kids. So my vantage point is a little different, right? And on top of that, I'm growing up in the house in the Latino culture. So on the outward, people are like, oh, like, he's black, he's black. But, you know, that's where the identity kind of situation comes into play, especially when you're young. But um, we didn't have the, um, the culture of black America hanging over our head because my family came in the 70s. So we didn't have the stories of the past kind of inundating us. Is representation important to you? And how does that play into the way that you move through your jobs, through your work, through the roles that you take, through the people that you hire? I think for me specifically working in advertising, uh, sort of in the background and now working in the gaming industry and like the board game industry, there's something about having people who do and look like you and are doing cool things makes you want to to achieve those things. I can tell you right now that if you go to a high school and you're talking here, especially like a high school that there's more low income sort of students, when you talk to them about jobs and entertainment, they don't know that all these people here behind the camera exist, exist <laughs> that are Latinos. There's different jobs from everyone, from the person over there with the camera, hi, or the sound technicians, or the directors. Those are all people that are behind there. 
And you don't see that representation because not in front of the camera. Marta Fernandez was an executive at Stars, and she's the reason why the show existed. And then she gave the opportunity to Tanya. And then Tanya gave that opportunity to all the writers, to all of us actors who were kind of fresh faced that had worked, but had never had a show, you know? And that's the biggest thing. And so it's so important to create and, and be kind of at the table. Like it's not about the race, it's about the culture, yeah. you know? And that's where you do need people in the writer's room that are talking about what you're talking about. Because then again, if you only have that one token Latino, then they have their one experience and they're like, oh, well, this is my experience. But then like, it wasn't everybody else's experience. You have the old guard, right? And they're used to making certain sound decisions, right? Because they were afraid to lose their position or to not be seen, not to be seen as obscene or out of hand or out of line. And so you have a lot of folks in my industry, to really be honest with you, this is no disrespect to HBCUs or Ivy Leagues, but they come from those institutions. So there's a certain pedigree and a certain way that they do things. And it's basically very, you know, vanilla, for lack of a better term. And so they're not used to bringing in ideas and really shaking it up. And I like to inundate hip hop with the tech space. So if you think about, you know, who's in the studio, you have your artists, you have your engineers, you may have your designers, you may have the A&R person to make sure everything goes well you know when you're doing a hackathon per se and that's like when people get together to build something you know you have your founder you have your you know computer engineers you know you have all those people that are putting together that prototype it's the same concept no different than a showcase right if you think about a showcase either someone is going to sing to show that they have talent or they're going to rap or whatever the case may be whoever's in that audience right that may be a uh, and r from a record company right and that person that is an AR front record company is equivalent to basically a venture capitalist at a big firm. Mm -hmm. And once you understand that, it, it's like, oh, the light bulb goes off. So now when someone that owns an independent label, they're more like an angel investor because they kind of put in their own money into the business and they want to invest in others. It sounds like there's like two, there's two paths, right? There's representation in terms of feeling seen, but then there's representation in terms of creating easier access to entrance, mm -hmm. you know? That you just said like this idea that hip hop can be compared to a venture capitalist, like that, that is something that you can wrap your head around instead of this barrier of I don't understand. Mm -hmm. um, and it makes it easier, I'm sure, yeah, to, yeah. to be able to walk in that room and know how to speak to those people. So what changes have you seen for visibility and representation in the Latinx community? I think YouTube has, I mean, has been a big, big help with all these um, companies and programming really putting out stories about the Latinx community. In particular, you know, with you know, Afro-Latinx has become a big thing for the last, I want to say three, four years. And so I think our story needs to be told. And I think like with us in, in media, I've been doing this for 22, almost 23 years now. And about every five years, it was always like, oh, this is our Latino time. This is a Latino time. This is a Latino time. And it just never happened. But you had like the George Lopez show or like the Brothers Garcia. You had the Ugly Betty. But I think when Jane the Virgin came out and the success that that had really kind of opened people's eyes to like, this woman's winning awards. Maybe we should do something like this. And then after Jane the Virgin, it was like on my block, Vida, one day at a time, all airing at the same time, which hadn't happened. Or at least for me, for my experience, you know? Um, and then just, I think it was in like 2020, you had like four or five shows premiere the same year. And it was like, whoa, like, so the difference now is that the audience is now saying, we want to be seen. I'm going to bring up a word, typecasting. Do you ever worry about that coming into fruition when it comes to different stereotypes, especially coming from where I'm you I'm going to get a little from? Mexican and all I have played is get a little Mexicans. So. You know what I mean? Yeah. But again, I know how I talk. I know how, what my energy is. And that's why I know I book these roles. It takes gatekeepers like the Marta Fernandez. And again, like David Ayer that wants to do a project with brown people in it. I'm gonna keep working until I can pick and choose those parts. Because then if I don't work, then I'd never work. Well, like and I want to do what said. I love. It's like we are mad about the typecasting. We are. Of course we are. We want to move past that. Yeah. But we got to do it and then we got to move past it. And we have to yeah. keep working. We have to keep paying our bills. And we kind of have to like play the system to then 
become the system, you know? With Millennial Loteria and our business, it was all about breaking those stereotypes. Like whatever that box is that we're in, we're gonna yeah. take you out of, you know? And so like for someone who could be cat, just like Latino women are just la dama, you know? So now it'd be la feminist. And I think I wanted to give that option in this game of like changing the way that people see Latinos, yeah. breaking their stereotypes. And that's the reason I think why it succeeded because there aren't other people doing that because they just wanna put you in this little box. So when I come around and I say, this game that's been around for generations for Latinos that it, we all kind of love, it is really playing off of stereotypes that are outdated and for like an older generation. Mm -hmm. And you come and you try to flip that. I mean, we made a Loteria card for Chelsea that was La Chingona, you know, for that we did for- That's for, like my official name now. That's her official name, yeah, actually, I think she has a trademark now. I gotta be careful. I don't have a trademark. Okay, okay. But I, like, <laughs> I have some merch that people created for me that I like, I have. The way that I could bring that representation was through technology because I didn't, have that gatekeeper telling me that I couldn't post something on Instagram because I can post something on Instagram. It cost me zero dollars. I don't have to do anything about it. And I put it on there and that's when it just starts to get more traction. You know, we're up to like 100,000, over 100,000 followers on TikTok um, or 70,000 on Instagram. And it's really just because we've been creating content for Latino millennials that feels fresh, it feels new, it feels now, it doesn't feel outdated, and it feels like it's breaking stereotypes that people have. I never started out to make a game in that way. I started making content to put online. It started to blow up on Instagram, and it got so big that people were demanding that I make them a game. And that's because, how you make a real business. Exactly, that's how you make it, Take because notes. I'm not creating, I'm not creating like the demand. The demand is there. Okay, so we've talked a lot about where we came from, where things are now, but we want to look to the future. How can we as a community um, uplift and empower each other? I support my, my friends like Ista, Ista Bug. They're like brand, the Isla Michelada, Michelada mix. Yeah. Oh my God. I have introduced so many people to that and they love it. So it's like, I try and stay supporting brown created stuff, whether it's shows or whether it's games or whether it's drinks. So that's what I do. Cause again, you gotta put your money where your mouth is. Like go follow Latino businesses, go follow Latino influencers, go follow them because having that, having a large follower count, I think opens the doors, even as much as you don't like want to say, it opens the doors to a lot of things because now it makes people look at you different, making people like, oh, it's not just one person, it's you plus an entire community, you know? I feel like social media and technology and, and in general that we can make our own content and post it. Mm -hmm. That's our own seat. That's our own table. That's our, That's own, our table. own seat. That's our own table. You know, there's like, so many pros and cons with social media. Yeah, so many pros and cons. But the, I think the pro for sure is that we can make our own stuff and put it out there and we can share it. We can share. I get to decide what I share. Yeah. I get to decide what I send people. So I do send the Latina investor to all my Latina friends and be like, get your money, girl. Like you need, you need to be following this account. Um, and that gives her more business. So it's, it's very, very powerful. It's been such a great conversation. We've hit on so many different topics. I just wanted to ask if you have any last final thoughts. Put your money where your mouth is because it's all about money at the end of the day. So support Millennial Loteria. You know what I mean? Get, we the plug is the plug. So now you know you got that. You know what I mean? Like. Watch Maya and the Three on Netflix. You know what I mean? Like just watching, buying, like we have so much power in that, but we don't know it. You could follow someone on, on social media. You can download uh, an app. You can buy a game. You can watch a show. So it's like, you can do that now. And if we all did that, it would be like, woof. Yeah. And it would, it would be a wave. It would be a, we could make a tsunami. Yeah. You know what I mean? But right now we're kind of just like hitting the shore with rocks. Little, little splash, little splash. But if all minorities, minorities supported each other, it would make, it would move mountains. In our community, you know, like it's, it's important to support each other, but it's also important too to, to know what you're consuming. You know, there's that age old saying of like, you are what you eat. That is, has never been more true now with social media because what we're eating, what we're consuming, what's shaping us is all through like what we're looking on our social media, what we're looking on our phone, our friends, who we surround ourselves with. So if you wanna grow, start consuming things that'll make you grow, mm -hmm. not things that'll make you 
um, doubt yourself or compare yourself to others, you know, like follow people who are in the Latino community, people who are giving value to you. And I think you'll be able to, in that way of consuming those, that information that's coming to you, you'll be able to put that in action and bring it forward. And, you know, I think that's what I want to do with Millennial Teria, with our, with our following, to give them stuff that's positive, that'll enrich their lives, that breaks stereotypes and makes people laugh and have fun. And that's, I think that's where there's been a, a part of our success that's always been hidden, you know, mm -hmm. because people know why they like us, but then they start to realize, when they start analyzing what I'm doing, they're like, okay, I'm, I'm learning from what he's doing and I can apply the same things to my business. I'm all about mindset. I have a saying. Um, obligation shouldn't wake you up in the morning. Opportunity should. So everyone wakes everyone wakes up in the morning with obligations. We got to go to work. We got to pay our bills. You know, we got to drop our kids off at school or we got to go to this session, blah, blah, blah. And sometimes we can get caught up in life, like just the drama and the ups and highs and peaks and valleys. Right. But if you kind of switch your mindset a bit and say, you know what, this is an opportunity. I wake up with an opportunity to be better a better entrepreneur, a better actress, you know, a, a better person, a better father, a better mother, et cetera, et cetera. The list goes on. You know, if you look at it from that context, because there, there's people here that are not here no more, right? So you got to look at it from a very humble point of view and say, this is an opportunity to be better. Well, thank you guys so much for being here and talking with me today and talking with each other. It was such a great conversation. And thank you so much for tuning in. If you have any insight, thoughts about what we just talked about, we want to hear from you as well. So drop it in the comments, send us a DM, keep the conversation going.